Philippa. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, how are you? Hi, yeah. You're doing well? Yeah, really good. Really good. 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 Um, I am really excited to talk to you today because um, the number one question I get asked from people right now mm -hmm. is, I don't know what to do because my husband is a Republican. He's a Trump supporter. I can't talk to my parents. Um, I get very frustrated online because there are all these people saying crazy, crazy things. I don't know what to do. Um, I've unblocked all these people or blocked all these people. Yeah. I, I, it just drives me crazy. And, and so I don't feel like I have great answers. I keep trying to come up with good answers, but I feel like I've learned a lot from you from the course that we created together for Count Me In To Win, which is on countmewintowin.org. Um, but I wanted to go a little deeper today. Um, so maybe what would be helpful is maybe you could just kind of do a quick review of what you have learned. But if you have examples that you could show us of people actually having a good conversation <laughs> across their differences, um, that would be, I think, really helpful. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I, this is, this is also the number one thing that I hear from people when I tell them that I've been organizing these conversations across the polit political divide. And people are like, how does that even work? I could never do that, you know? So it's, and it is really hard. It's really hard. And I've been doing it ever since the 2016 election. And I still like have moments where I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. Yeah, so, I love the yeah. title. I love the title of your project, mm -hmm. um, Looking for America, because I think when we can't talk to each other, it really feels like we're disconnected and it, it, we feel lost and it doesn't feel like United States of America. And so we can't even understand like what our national identity is right now, I think, because the conversation is not there. And so you're trying to reconstitute us by engaging in these conversations which is amazing i think it's just what i i feel like we need as a country and for our democracy to work but it's really hard so so give us some guidance like what do we do and and what what have you learned like what works mm -hmm. well it's not easy but it's easy and so I can kind of boil it down to one singular thing that we can all, that we should all start with. And um, I, there's a book out there that kind of illustrates it even better than I could ever explain it. So I really recommend this book. It's called Beyond Contempt. And what this woman has done is written a book for liberals to say, hey, look y'all, Whenever you have, you, you may want to have conversations with people who are, uh, think differently from you politically, but when you do, you act contemptuous and nobody wants to be condescended to. Nobody is going to have a conversation with you if you're contemptuous of them. So the very first thing you have to really check yourself on and to really work on, and it is hard, it's really hard, is to let go of your contempt for the other for the other folks. Um, and if you can't do that, anything else I say is not gonna work um, because contempt like oozes out of your pores, you know, no matter how, even if you're trying to fake it um, by saying like, the right words, it'll just ooze out of you. So I don't know. But, I mean, how do you, how, but how do you do that? I mean, I get it in theory. Yeah. But how do you do it? Because it, it, it is really hard to control yeah. when somebody's saying things that really trigger me or that I find just so outrageous or offensive. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't think this is going to be a very satisfactory answer to you. I mean, I will, I, I promise I'll get around to like actual real advice, but I think the really unsatisfactory answer is that we have to really look within ourselves first. Like what is it in yourself that is causing you to have so much contempt for these folks. Like they are speaking their truth. You are speaking your truth. 
why are you having such a hard time accepting that people are just freaking different from you and they have a they have different experiences from you that have mm -hmm. led them to, to this point so you know what is it within yourself that's keeping you from being able to respect that so that's hard that takes a lot of introspection and it's mm -hmm. again not easy it's it, and it, i got this also from um you know i, I listen to a lot of brene brown now and <laughs> Saint Brene, yes. <laughs> oh, I know, but you know, I, I, yeah, I, it just sounds like kooky sometimes when I say it out loud. It sounds kooky to me, but it's like think about relationships, like all the kinds of relationships you have. What, how do you have better relationships with people you actually like? It's the same principles of relationship building. If you don't have respect, if you have contempt for others, your relationships aren't going to be very good. It's the same principles. You're talking to a single person. So, <laughs> so um, but I mean, okay. but also with your family, like, you know, your relationship with your parents, your, yeah. your friends, it's the same, again, it's all kinds of relations. Right. But yes. Yeah, yeah, no, you're <laughs> okay, so having said all that, I mean, yes. I feel like when I'm struggling with this, what yeah. I do is, I try to just focus on connecting with them as a person and not expect to change their mind. If I feel like I've got to change your mind, I got to get them to take this off their Facebook page or, you know, whatever. If I have that kind of agenda, then yeah, it just goes south. But if I just try to focus on connecting with them as a person, then, then I can, I can be okay with the fact that they, have a totally different view and they're gonna keep this crazy thing on their Facebook page or tell me I should listen to Q and on or whatever it is they're saying. So, um, but still it, it is a very difficult time because I am scared. I'm scared of Trump getting reelected. I'm scared of this pandemic. I'm scared of all the crazy things that are going on in our country that I don't understand. So, I feel like part of it is like I have to figure out how to deal with my fears. Yeah. And I think that's right. And I think that um, I also am terrified <laughs> of the reelection of this president. Um, but I also know that we, you know, we talk a lot about this bubble that we're in. And I do think that that's a real thing. Like, the thing that may gave me actually more hope is that I actually went out, you know, my project took me across the country and it made me talk to people everywhere in our country. It made me realize most people are not QAnon supporters. Most people do not have extreme polarized views. 70% of Americans actually want to talk to each other. There's like this study called the, um, hidden tribes, and it talks about the exhausted majority, the 70% of Americans who are exhausted by polarization, exhausted by the fear mongering, and do not want to be controlled by the polarization industrial complex. We need to disrupt this narrative that says we can't talk to each other because most Americans want to talk to each other and they're not espousing crazy ideas. And so, I mean, this is the problem with engaging with people on Facebook, you know, on the social media. Like, most people who are engaged, not most, but many times, many people who are engaging that way are like these kind of loud polarized extremes. Most people aren't engaging. They, they're like exhausted and want to, they avoid that kind of engagement. So then we like get this false sense of like, oh my God, they all think that. When I just don't think that's true. I, I, and that's my anecdotal experience. You know, I don't have research to back that up other than this hidden tribe study. But my anecdotal support of that study is people aren't that, are not, not as wacky as we think they are. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, I really want you to think about doing a regular podcast or some show <laughs> where people can come to you for advice and guidance on how to do this because 
I need, I feel like I need hand holding because I feel like I'm better than average person because I've also done a lot of conversations, but it still is exhausting. I know. I trust me. No, I've I have done a lot of them, and I'm like, okay, I need to go talk to some liberal friends right now to like re-energize myself because ah, that was hard. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard for them too to talk to us. So yeah, you know that's true. Um, yeah, but but think about it, Philippa, because I I do think we need to have somebody like the Brene Brown of talking across differences. Someone who can give us a lot of really good pointers that are practical yeah. um, on how to deal idea. with this. Like like a call-in show. And people are like, hey, this is my situation. That's not a fun idea, actually. Yeah. Well, anyway, think about it. I yeah. wanna I wanna help I wanna help you do it. Um, I like it. but I wanna get back to what you were you were actually asking earlier. <laughs> because yes, I'm trying to get out of this tangent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do that yes because you know you said that you know you are trying to connect with people uh you know as basically as a human right like they're not just these avatars and that you know that's definitely for the first way of looking looking at it is these are human beings who like have feelings and emotions just like us and so that's that's truly is step one, but how do you get to that point? Like, how do you actually humanize that person? And so the, the ways, you know, with a very simple, basic way we've been doing it through the Looking for America project is to do, you know, storytelling, ask people to tell us their stories that have nothing to do with politics, that are just, who are you? You know, what, what, what made you the person you are today? You know, what are the kinds of questions that you can ask that, that make this person, like make this person actually a real person um, that are beyond the politics. You have to start there before you even get to the harder questions. So I think that's really important. Um, can I show you a quick picture of, you know, one of the storytelling bits that we do? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. in the, so in the project, what we do is we ask people to bring an object that sort of represents that helps them tell a story about their American identity, like the, because the central question of the project is, what does it mean to be American in your community? And so we start with an object, a storytelling around this object. So one, they're storytelling, but two, like it sort of gets the focus away from the person and like refocuses on this object so that, you know, it's easier. It's like just kind of a way in. So, um, so let me show you this one project, this one um, object that somebody brought in. So um, this is a muckluck that somebody in Anchorage brought in. And um, she told the story of how, I mean, it was like this amazing story of how in Alaska, um, you know, they're so far and remote from us that they don't even think of themselves as Americans first. They think of themselves as Alaskans and being American is like sort of this afterthought. And so I thought, oh, that's so interesting um, because I kind of think of uh, Alaska as this exotic place as well. So I thought, oh yeah, okay, that makes some sense. Um, so that was kind of interesting how she started that. But this muckluck, um, you know, it obviously represents the native peoples that you know, whose land we took from them. Um, we took their land from them so that we could make it the 49th state. And so, you know, this, she talks about her, um, her own native um, family and how, you know, there are like all these atrocities committed. Like, do you know about how, like, how young children were taken away from their parents and put into boarding schools where they yeah. were, yeah, like where they were basically stripped of their heritage and their language and their culture. I mean, it was really just like a horrific thing. And so for her, being American is like a pretty horrific thing because that happened to her. Um, people brought in such amazing objects, though, you know, from Bibles. One guy brought in his um, open carry license for his gun. 
Um, so that meant, you know, that was what it meant to him to be American, passports, food. It was so, anyway, you just, we just really learned a lot about people through these. Wow. Movies. Wow. That's extraordinary. I really like that idea. Um, do you think that people, um, come away from these experiences feeling good about things? Like what, what actually happens? Yeah, they were, I mean, mostly. Um, there have been a couple instances of people um, feeling attacked or, you know, very uncomfortable. Um, but, and I want to get back to that, but I mean, most people leave saying, oh my gosh, like, when can we do this again? I, you know, that, that was the first time I even had a conversation like that, that where tensions got high, but we still, you know, we worked through it. So one of sort of the problems right now, obviously, is that we can't, it's really hard to continue those conversations. So we had like the first conversation in a lot of places around the country, but, and then our plan for this year had been to go back and continue those conversations. So it's been really hard because it is really hard to, you can't change anything with one conversation. Like it takes sustained contact over time. Um, we base this whole thing around the, this idea of contact theory. Like the more frequency of contacts you have between people, the more likely you are able to reduce prejudice, um, to, to gain more understanding and agreement. Um, and we just haven't been able to do that because COVID. So, this, so we have been trying different methodologies, um, you know, through digital um, meetings, things like that. It's hard. It's just really hard because mm -hmm. you have to have frequent, frequent com conversations. So you've been doing Zoom calls? Yes, yes. Um, oh my gosh. So at the beginning of the quarantine, I was very resistant to doing Zoom calls, like to have these kind of conversations take place on Zoom. Like I just did not feel that it was intimate enough, but I am a total believer now. <laughs> I'm a convert too. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's never gonna, you know, be a substitute for real life, but it is a darn good compliment. Like it, it's, it's been great because otherwise, how could we even have these kind of conversations during this time? But two, we have been able to bring people together across different geographies. And that's really important because we know that a lot of our polarization is around geographic polarization, like rural, urban, um, mm -hmm. like east, west. You know, I mean, there's so many different kinds of polarizations that things contributing to polarization that we can actually address because of Zoom. So that's been kind of cool too. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a little clip from one of our conversations that we did early on that kind of mm -hmm. illustrates you know having talking about something that is kind of difficult where people nor often do feel triggered um so i could play that really quick for you okay that'd be great conversations always that you guys brought up and, and i don't get that is the feeling guilty about white privilege you were born that way you didn't choose it it's not your fault you know, I mean, why would anybody feel bad about how they were born or feel like they have a burden because they were born with a certain skin color? I didn't choose mine. I'm glad I got some good stuff out of it. I got some stuff that I wish was different, but that has nothing to do with anybody else. That's just my reality. And I think there's sometimes that some of this is also an overreaction to trying to make people feel bad for things that they don't control. You know, you guys don't control how you were born. I don't control it either. Why would anybody have to feel bad about it? I, I feel bad about my actions that I take. But, you know, there's a lot of Hispanics in Los Angeles and in Chicago and, that are doing stuff that I'm not proud of. And, you know, I wish that they didn't have tattoos over their face and their neck. And I wish, I wish they weren't, you know, crossing over drugs because it makes me look bad. I think, at least I hope that what I mean by white privilege is the misuse of those privileges that we have, that I keep my white privilege and don't do anything to help somebody else who doesn't have it. It goes on a little bit and there's a guy, so the guy who was speaking is from El Paso. Um, the, woman, the, the woman who was speaking is from Sioux City. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's a person in the upper corner who's nodding a lot, a white guy nodding a lot while mm -hmm. the city lady is talking. 
he could not be, he's even more conservative than the guy who was speaking. And he goes on to talk about like, yeah, we need to, we, we have to address our white privilege. Like it was, but the way they did it, I just thought was so brilliant, like not getting angry, um, just like, just trying to address, like talk about how they feel, not trying to attack the person, but talking about like, this is how I see it. I'm, I'm not gonna attack you. This is just how I see it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That sounds really interesting. I mean, do you think that, because conservatives tend not to even like this concept of white privilege, but do you think when they're talking about it among people who are not attacking them, but want to engage them, they're more, just more receptive to it? So it's really not the message, but maybe it's the messenger that goes back to your point about contempt. Exactly. I think mm -hmm. that there are so many times when we could totally find areas of agreement, except that if you are being treated with contempt, then I, I do it too. Like, then I'll be like, oh, well, I'm just going to say the opposite thing of what I actually believe just to piss you off because you're acting this way. Like, right. I will literally do that. I'm like, why am I doing that? That's so ridiculous. But it's just because I'm having this emotional response too of like, F you right. for attacking me. I'm just going to say something now to piss you off. It's yeah. human nature. I mean, it's human nature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it speaks to the fact that just the cultural norm is very adversarial. People just think that people are enemies if they're not in the same tribe or they're not in agreement, right? And so I just wonder if it gets back to this question about people feeling like they don't know who they are, they feel lost, you know, and we don't have a national identity right now that can unite us. That, you know, and this is why I think conservatives complain so much about identity politics because they feel excluded. Because when, when they think identity politics, it's like people in oppressed groups. Yeah. So then where do they fit in? Are they just oppressors? And so it's not so much that I, I, I am all for seeking um, just social justice and racial justice, but I feel like, can we talk about this in a way that doesn't exclude white people and make them our oppressors? you know it i i mean i we i think we can and we should because when you go when you are talking to somebody and you are entering that conversation of saying you're a racist oppressor how is a person supposed to react to that you know i, I if somebody called me a racist oppressor i that'd be hard right you know i started this whole project just around my dinner table Right after the 2016 election, I invited some Trump voters over to my house for dinner because I was curious. I, like, I wasn't trying to make a project out of it. I was just like, oh my God, like, I got to ask some questions directly. And that's sort of what led to this larger project. At one of the dinners, um, one woman said, Trump is a racist. And this conservative woman said, she just called me racist. And I was like, and then everybody at the table was like, no, she didn't. She called Trump a racist. And so then we became this whole conversation around, you know, trying to like say, like this idea, I'm, this kind of brings up other issues too, because like when you call, you know, when you call Trump a racist, you're, they view you calling them race, the, the Trump voter a racist. And in a way, that is what we're doing. We have, liberals have literally said, if you voted for Trump, you're a racist. And that makes no sense. Like, we're all racist. So like, if that's really the, the benchmark, then we're all racist at some level. So I think we have to like back off from that way of, th of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about this because, you know, like, I think Ibram Kendi says it really well. It's like, fine. It's not really a matter of being racist or not racist. It's a matter of being anti-racist. So calling somebody a racist doesn't really mean anything anymore. 
because we're all racist. We all, you know, all white people benefit from uh, the, the systems of oppression. So it's, uh, it's meaningless. So anyway, I guess all of that is to say is like, we've got to back off from these personal, these, these, these personal broad attacks that don't really mean anything. It's not even just that it's insulting. It's like, what do you even mean by that? It's not helpful. Mm -hmm. What's helpful is to think about anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be hard, though, because they have become ways we identify ourselves and other people that of these categories like racist or some ist. Um, and we're, I think we're missing that. We're missing kind of other kind of sources, like these blocks of material we could use to constitute our identities, because we don't right now, if you just ask someone like, tell me about you, they will probably start with maybe where they grew up and then their political identifier. Yeah, and I think that that's relatively new, right? Like, I mean, in the old days, your political identifier wasn't the wasn't even the fortieth most important thing about you. It just, you know what I mean? Like, somehow your political identification became the most important thing. Have you seen the study that said that you know how it's shifted from like if if a, if you brought if you brought home to your family a person that you wanted to marry in the you know before five years ago, if they would have rejected somebody who said that they were Muslim, but now they reject you if they if you say that your partner is liberal, <laughs> a Democrat. Like that's even worse than you know being a different religion. Like, yeah, it's amazing to me that somehow politics became that important to people as an identification. Another interesting fact that goes with that is that. People seem very consumed by politics, but our voter turnout is low compared to other countries. Um, and I <laughs> just think, what gives? It's like, if you're that consumed by politics, well, at least vote. Yeah, at least show up. Totally. I know. You don't even vote. <laughs> it's perplexing. You're absolutely, I mean, it is so perplexing. Um, but, but I think that that goes to this idea of like, the, this group dynamic thing that's happening where, you know, the in-group, out-group, like you, we talk a lot about, now it's about the group um, integration. It's not really even about the politics anymore. It's about saying, I'm part of this group that calls itself Republican or Democrat. But it's, you know what I mean? It's not about the politics. It's about being part of the group. When you work with people and you see these differences, do you sometimes think that's just, it's really is about helping them understand what the facts are? Not exactly, because mm -hmm. there are also like social science studies that say that, you know, the more you throw facts at a person, the more they actually get dug into whatever belief they already had. So it's, you have to be very careful about just throwing facts and reasoning toward at a person. Um, and again, letting go of the idea that you're going to use facts and figures to persuade them. Like you cannot go into these conversations trying to persuade people. You can only go in to listen, ask questions, and share your personal stories. And ask questions from like a personal perspective. Um, not, you know, not like what are the facts that make you believe this, but like digging deeper. Um, I can't think of a good example right the second, but like what in your what in your life experience led you to believe this thing that you that, that you say that you believe? Um, and then asking more questions about that, like digging deeper into that. You know, it's 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 the fundamental um, idea behind deep canvassing. It's like if you go in saying, you know, like when we talk about immigration, if you saying this many, um, this this percentage of immigrants contribute, you know. $10 billion to our economy every year, nobody is going to be convinced by that argument. Um, like, we've got to dig deeper. You know, I was thinking about, like, my mom, who is an immigrant, but thinks, you know, it's often like, build the wall and keep out all the immigrants. 
And I'm just like, why would you think that? You know, and then I tried that whole methodology of telling her what, how great immigrants are. But in the end, that's not what she's scared of. When I finally asked her more questions, what I finally learned is that, you know, she's scared of a couple things. I mean, one is she's scared of like socialism slash communism. She came from a country that was taken over by communists. She's Vietnamese. And so any sort of inkling of a, like socialism to her feels like a threat. And so when we, when we start saying, we've got to like give health care to all the refugees, all anybody who's here, whether they're citizens or not, that feels to her like socialism. And, and I keep using the word feel because that's a whole other thing that is kind of interesting from a social science perspective too, is that we all believe that we make choices, like we believe our beliefs are based on, like especially us liberals, we think we have beliefs based on facts and reason and rationality. Social science says that for most people, our beliefs are based on feelings and on experience, our life experiences, and we use facts to support whatever we already believe. We don't start with the facts, we start with our feelings and we use the facts to support our feelings. We do it on both sides. And right, I okay. It was like very no. to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, I remember working with a friend, um, I, you know, just like a fellow screenwriter um, on his horror movie. Like he wanted to do a horror movie. And we kept coming around the question of like, well, what's the monster? Like, what's the monster? What is the thing that's like scaring people? Um, and then he would come up with the wackiest ideas for what the monster is anyway. But sometimes I feel like maybe that's the question in a way. It's like, who's your monster? Like, what's the thing that you're deep down really afraid of? And so if it's for your mom, like communism, that's the monster. And so if we don't know that, like she's like in her horror movie and she's trying to run away from this monster, then we can't connect with her. So in some ways I feel we gotta figure out what people are deeply afraid of, you know? That's and for me, yeah. And I feel like for me, like my fear is that, um, sorry, I don't mean to turn this into my therapy session, but <laughs> <Tell me about yourself. laughs> I'm just going to tell you what I'm afraid of. Um, but like my fear is um, a dictatorship. And so I'm, I'm living my nightmare because I feel like Trump is a dictator or a dictator wannabe that he would take every opportunity to do that because he's so hell-bent on power. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm living through my biggest nightmare right now. Mm -hmm. And and so it's not communism, even though being South Korean, well, having been born in South Korea, you would think I'm afraid of that, but no, I'm actually not afraid of communism. I'm afraid of dictatorships. I'm afraid of brutal uh, people that were used political ideology to justify genocide and war. Yeah. And so, yeah, anyway, I don't know. So, I, so in some ways I feel like that's kind of what it means to go deeper is like what in the end, in your heart, are you most afraid of? I love that metaphor of what's the monster. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> Like, what are you, what's your, the monster that you're afraid of? Yeah. Um, God, that's, that's really good. Um, you know, and the thing is, even when we get to this point, when you recognize your monster and the person you're talking to, you, you recognize their monster and everybody recognizes their monster, you still might not actually agree on anything. <laughs> but I mean, it is a starting point for finding ways of you know, finding the solutions to our common problems. Because like, if you can't even see those, who, you, the other person's monster and your own monster, you can't even find, there's no way you can even get to that conversation of finding the solution. And so that's why I was saying earlier in our conversation, like 
we, I don't even let people talk about politics until like the very end and they feel very dissatisfied um, with that. With some, some people feel very dissatisfied because they think they're coming in to have like this fight, a political fight. It's like, you can't, I'm not going to let you go there yet because you don't even know this person yet. You don't know what makes them tick yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think we have to really set expectations because you just, it's, for most people, it's just too hard to have a, a, a bigger conversation about politics before you have this conversation about mm -hmm. monsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really good. I like the monsters. <laughs> Let's do this. I would love to check in with you regularly. I, I'm very serious about helping you get started like with your own show and talking regularly um, about like real life situations that are breaking people's hearts and leading to divorces and people not speaking to each other. Uh, those to me, just at a collective level, it's just like, that's how you end up with the civil war when you can't even bear to talk to members of your family and they become so dehumanized to you that you can't deal with them at all because of their political views. And so I think it's a very serious problem and I am so grateful to you that you take it on, like you're just, you just like, you just got grabbed it by its bullhorn and you're just doing it, which is amazing um, and, and heroic. Well, I Honestly. appreciate saying that, but I also, I also want to tell you, like, the more I do it, the more hopeful I become, I'm, you know? So that's the message I want to tell people. Like, if you start, it's so hard to take that first leap. But I'm telling you, the more you do it, the yeah. more you realize this is possible and it must be done. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. It's just that two months before the election, it's just a terrible time to be yeah. an, uh, to be doing this because people are so scared, right? This is like the third act of the horror movie, you know? It's like yeah. we have no idea how it's going to get resolved and who's going to die, you know? Well, I, I mean, I agree. Like for me, going yeah. between now and the election, like I think we should be focusing on get out the vote and you know, those kinds of things. I mean, I totally agree with you, but not because I'm so scared. I mean, I am scared, but I also, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to be one of those people who, you know, watched the Nazis take over by being complacent. I, I'm absolutely not at that point. But I also see evidence of actions being taken to put the guardrails on a Trump. You know, I was thinking about that day he basically brought out, you know, military force, military level force against peaceful protesters so he could go and like hold up his Bible in front of St. John's Church. Um, I was there that day. Mm. And, you know, it was terrifying, like terrifying. But then within a matter of days, I mean, it took days, but you know, all the military, the, the, the generals, the, the secretary of defense, they came out and said that was wrong and that should never have happened. So, you know what I mean? So I, I get it, man. Like, there's a lot of bad shit happening that, that is, ab is, is absolutely having a bad effect on our on mm -hmm. Americans. And what gives me some little sliver of hope is that 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 did happen that there are guardrails that will keep him from becoming a full-on dictator mm -hmm. okay like our systems that's work you know yeah i mean and i want to i i agree with you i was glad that happened that so many people came out and said i shouldn't have done that that was not good but i feel like he has more or less gotten away with everything yeah. he has done that's why i'm like what's going on here and he's normalized insane behavior right and i i just say like what happened in portland and it's still happening in portland like what, what's happening in portland could really become well what happened in charlottesville we could become charlottesville in by middle of november mm -hmm. if we don't have clear resolution on this election right and i feel like i guess for me I need to be mentally prepared for it. Otherwise, I feel like I'm going to just freak out, 
you know? So that's why I go to a dark place in a way just to prepare myself for anything that may happen. Yeah, I get it. Like, prepare for the worst. I get it. Yeah. Um, But... But anyway, let's check in again. Yes, I, yes. I really want to do this regularly because I, I, I benefit so much from talking to you. And I am so like, I just admire what you're doing um, and that you've been doing this for four years. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> it's a long time <laughs> to oh do God. this. <laughs> but uh, thank you. And um, I'll check in with you again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Annika. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. okay great chatting with you too you've been listening to conversations about a way forward from count me into win and the talk on main street to learn more find us on facebook at the talk on main street